are when the sun rise, as it does 365 times every year. As in man's golden age, at the beginning of history, and in the time before history. But this is a most singular sunrise. It is the climactic part of a scientific experiment that can be conducted only at midsummer, at the moment of dawn in a prehistoric ruin. This experiment may link one of the oldest major works of man's hands, the full sarsen circle at Stonehenge, and a winking, blinking marvel of the 20th century. It's designed to test a theory that has challenged established tradition and provoked among scientists one of the fascinating controversies of our time. A theory that credits prehistoric man with an ingenuity and knowledge some authorities believe impossible. Stonehenge through the ages has drawn poets and archeologists, astronomers and tourists, all seeking in their fashion an answer to the single question, why? If in this experiment, which you will witness in the next hour, the sun follows a prescribed pattern around these stones, much of the mystery that has tantalized man for centuries may be solved. The Mystery of Stonehenge, with CBS News correspondent, Charles Collingwood. You are 90 miles from London. But somewhere in the two-hour drive across Salisbury Plain, you lose the world. You lose all the thousands of years of recorded time and enter the dark, dateless world of prehistory. Stonehenge, immense, brooding, haunted by crows, a lonely ruin on the plain, raised by a race now faceless and forgotten. Legends cluster around these stones, on this spot, they say, Hengist the Saxon killed 400 British nobles by treachery. Here, where the Grey Plain ran with blood, this monument was raised in memory of the slain. The truth is, when the Saxons passed this way, Stonehenge was already a ruin. So was it 2,000 years ago when Roman soldiers on leave made the trip across Salisbury Plain to see it and ask the questions we still ask. Who built it? What men wrote their aspirations, their dreams, their terrors here in stone long before the Greeks took Troy or Moses led the exodus from Egypt or Hammurabi wrote his code of laws in Babylon? The past in those lands has left its story. But on this island, the stones are mute and anonymous. Will we ever read their message? These men say the message is clear. Stonehenge was the temple of an ancient Celtic priesthood, the Druids. This modern group has claimed their ritual and some grandiose ideas. The Druids go right back into the mists of time. And according to our traditions, the Druids built Stonehenge. And we're not asking anybody to believe this, and we don't care whether the statement is accepted or not. That is our tradition and according to our records. We believe that the Druids own Stonehenge as representatives of the people. Is it peace? It, it is, is peace. peace. Is it peace? Peace. peace. Arise, O 
sun. Let the darkness of night fade in the beams of thy glorious light. Of all the legends about Stonehenge, the most persistent is that the Druids built it. They didn't. Author Patrick Moore scuttles their claims with some scientific facts. There's no evidence, there's a great deal of evidence that they didn't. It wasn't their kind of temple at all, and anyway, the dating is all wrong. The first parts of Stonehenge may have been put up about 2000 BC, round about that time anyway, and Stonehenge was certainly complete well before 1000 BC. There is no mention of the Druid cult in Britain much before 300 BC, and in fact, we can be fairly certain that there were no Druids in Britain before 400 BC. So Stonehenge is as far away from the Druids in time as we are from the Norman invasion of Britain. The archaeologists don't know this, and they don't know that. But by some mysterious reason, they do seem to know that the Druids had nothing to do with Stonehenge. How they reconcile these two facts, I wouldn't know. If the Druids didn't build Stonehenge, who did? Reconciling facts is full-time work for the archaeologists, and they don't do it in libraries. Professor Richard Atkinson of University College Cardiff has spent 15 years investigating that mystery. Under his direction, this ancient earth has been combed and sifted handful by handful so the bits of its story could be fitted together. Not much has survived 4,000 years. There is little evidence of where or how the people who built Stonehenge lived. But their barrow tombs dot the plain, and with his scanty clues, Atkinson has put together a picture of them. The men who built these long barrows about 2000 BC brought the revolution of farming instead of hunting as a way of life. Already their architecture was based on a standard unit of measurement used throughout Britain. There is evidence that they practiced human sacrifice. These are the people who may have laid out the first Stonehenge circle. The Stone Age farmers were conquered in 1800 BC by men who used bronze weapons. It was they who built the great stone circle at Avebury and may have raised the second Stonehenge. At this time, differences in wealth and class appeared with a warrior aristocracy such as Homer described. Silbury Hill, largest prehistoric mound in Europe. Archaeologists believe that somewhere within it lies the great chief who, in about 1500 BC, completed the building of Stonehenge. Archaeologists use many techniques for finding out about the past and draw on many scientific disciplines. Advances in chemistry and physics enabled them to date Stonehenge. Everything that lives holds particles of radioactive carbon. When an organism dies, that carbon begins to dwindle at a known rate. Check how much is left in any organic relic, and you know its age. Tests on a deer antler, a digging tool from Stonehenge, proved it was used 4,000 years ago, a thousand years before the Druids. Men of many sciences have worked on the Stonehenge mystery. Geologists traced the origin of the stones. Botanists studying fossil pollen learned the curious fact that the weather was considerably warmer all year round when Stonehenge was built. But the most startling discovery has come from the science of astronomy. The digging was done at an observatory 4,000 miles from Stonehenge. Dr. Gerald Hawkins, astronomer at the Harvard-Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory and professor at Boston University, has developed a startling and revolutionary theory that may solve the Stonehenge mystery. I'm convinced that Stonehenge was an astronomical observatory and was also used as a computer for following the movement of the moon around the horizon. In my estimation, Stonehenge should be rated as the eighth wonder of the ancient world. There's been a lot of speculation about the astronomy at Stonehenge uh, for a long time. 
And uh, I felt that it was an observatory, without thinking too deeply about it. I was rather surprised to find that no detailed astronomical calculations had been made. And so, perhaps for the first time, I, as an astronomer, began to calculate all of the possibilities in the archways and stone holes at the site. The archways, 20 feet high and only one foot wide, too narrow to walk through. Then why were they built? The astronomers answer, to look through at heavenly bodies. Tradition said the Stonehenge axis pointed to the midsummer sunrise with a boulder called the heel stone to mark the exact spot. Scientists said it was only approximate, inconclusive. But according to Hawkins's figures, the heel stone marked the sunrise exactly. What did the other stones mark? He put the plan of Stonehenge on a plotting machine. The positions of everything, stones, stone holes, and archways, were measured and the positions punched automatically on cards. The question he wanted answered, between 2000 and 1500 BC, did any combination of stones or archways line up with the rise or set points of any heavenly bodies? He looked for a match with the planets and all the major stars. Now, the sun rises in the east in spring. Gradually, the rising point moves farther north along the horizon until midsummer. Then it starts back. In autumn, it's in the east again. It moves southward until midwinter's day, then turns back to repeat the yearly cycle. The moonrise point moves back and forth across the horizon in an even more complicated pattern than the sun. There was a card for each of its key positions. After repeated measurements, over 200 positions of stones and holes were fed into the computer. These positions were taken in pairs and the directions they pointed to on the horizon were calculated. The answer came back from the computer in 60 seconds. Star alignments, no relationship. Planets, nothing. But for the sun, the computer found 10 matching alignments, and then a surprise. 14 Stonehenge alignments point directly to the key rising and setting points of the moon. 24 precise alignments, all based on the calculation that the sun rose directly over the heel stone at midsummer. The historian Diodorus of Sicily wrote in 50 BC, there are on the island of Hyperborea both a magnificent sacred precinct of Apollo and a notable temple, circular in shape. The moon viewed from this island appears to be but a little distance from the earth. The account is also given that the god visits the island every 19 years. Could Hyperborea have been England? An archeologist sent Hawkins the quotation and asked if there were anything spectacular the moon might do every 19 years. Hawkins's quick reaction, an eclipse, perhaps over the heel stone. An eclipse like this one at Stonehenge was sheer terror for the ancients. Even today, primitive people bang pans and shoot guns to drive off evil spirits from devouring the moon. A Stone Age priest who knew when an eclipse was due would have tremendous power. Hawkins went back to the computer to find out about full moons, when they were eclipsed, when they were over the heel stone. The first figure out of the machine was the one he was looking for, 19 years. The midwinter full moon is eclipsed over the heel stone at intervals of 19 years, 19 years, and 18 years. Total cycle, 56 years. What was the significance? Then he remembered. Those 56 white spots around the outer circle of Stonehenge. 56 chalk-filled holes called Aubrey holes after the man who discovered them. Archaeologists had never been able to explain those holes. They were the most baffling mystery at Stonehenge. Why were they dug? They had never held posts or stones. As soon as they were dug, they were filled up again. No one could explain their purpose or the peculiar number, 56 holes. 
56 years in the eclipse cycle. Was it just a wild coincidence? He began to experiment. Suppose you put marker stones in certain Aubrey holes, shifted them one hole per year. When a certain stone arrived at a marked hole, that would be the year of an eclipse. When a stone was in the right archway of the Sarsen Circle, that would tell you the day. Counting the days with the Sarsen Circle and the years with the 56 Aubrey holes, Stonehenge could be used as a computer to predict eclipses. Incredible? The figures were in front of him. There was no doubt that it worked on paper. Would it work at Stonehenge? Professor Atkinson was not sure this was really the reason for those 56 Aubrey holes. Now, his suggestion here is really a way of explaining why there are 56 of these holes and not 55 or 57 or any other number. He suggested that these 56 Aubrey holes could have been used as a kind of special purpose computer for predicting the occurrence of eclipses. But this, of course, isn't the real question. The real question is, was it used in this way? Did they actually set out the Aubrey holes for this purpose and use them to predict eclipses? I find this very difficult to imagine. These people were what I would call howling barbarians. They were practically savages. And everything else we know about them suggests that they were quite incapable of this degree of scientific and technological sophistication. Dr. Glyn Daniel, professor of prehistory, Cambridge University. When you read people describing them as barbarians or howling barbarians, this is just a, a wrong conception of them altogether. Were they as intelligent as contemporary men? I think I'd put it this way, that the people of the time of Stonehenge were not only skilled in working stone, they were people who could uh, travel by sea from the East Mediterranean up into Britain. They therefore must have been good navigators, good shipbuilders. I think they were very intelligent. A theory is one thing in an office at Harvard. It may be something else on the spot. Could Hawkins get the answers he wanted at Stonehenge at midsummer? He flew to England to test his theory at the site and talked to correspondent Alexander Kendrick. It doesn't look like an observatory, does it, in our sense of the word. How did it work? You wouldn't recognize it in a, as an observatory. The modern observatories have telescopes and domes. The ancient Britons uh, worked with the only material they had, which was stone. These stones are set in very definite positions. They mark the rising and setting of the sun and moon through the year. And in fact, the precision with which these stones are set uh, is remarkable. I doubt whether we could do it today without a lot of careful surveying. And uh, by following the sun and the moon, they could regulate their calendar. They could follow the year. And what is more important, I'm sure that they could predict eclipses with this. It's uh, an instrument for following the mo motion of the sun and the moon so carefully that you could even predict eclipses. Was the sun uh, really that frequent? Was it more frequent then than it is now here? It would be no uh, overstatement to say that Stonehenge could not have been built today. The weather in England, unfortunately, is not good enough. No, they must have had better conditions. And if we look in the uh, records, there's a growing feeling that uh, 2,000 years B.C. was a very balmy period in England. It's called the uh, hypothermal time. It was almost a Mediterranean climate here, believe it or not. But looking back with the advantage of hindsight, uh, we think that there was a plan. Now, is it conceivable that there was no plan, that the thing simply grew, so to speak? If it was just one position marked, it might have been chance but I've found uh, dozens of positions. This is impossible to attribute to chance. So there was a plan, and a very grandiose plan. Uh, everything about this monument is coupled to the rising and setting of the sun and the moon. And uh, the whole enterprise was one single-minded thought and one cultural idea. 
But you call this a single purpose unit, so to speak. Couldn't it also have had a religious significance? Yes, surely. When we talk about the sun and the moon, you must remember I'm an astronomer. The Stonehenge people thought the sun was the probably the he-god and the moon maybe the she-god. Uh, surely they were following their gods. As they rose and sat, they followed them round the sky and they felt that they were powerful objects. But then may they have simply been looking at them as powerful objects rather than as a calendar uh, that keeps coming around year after year. Yes, uh, they were following them because they were maybe frightened of them. And uh, I'm not saying that they were purely and simply astronomers. Uh, astronomy, of course, didn't come into existence until maybe a thousand, two thousand years later. But they had this sense of precision and they must have been reassured to find that their gods were on course. I think if the sun rose in the wrong place, they would have been terrified. Even today, I think, if the sun started doing peculiar things, we would have a very funny feeling about it. But, Professor, these people were Stone Age people, and the archaeological evidence is that they lived in the most rude and barbaric kind of way. Is it conceivable that a people so backward in so many other aspects could have been so forward in this one thing, that is to say, the use, collection and use of scientific knowledge? Well, barbarian is a strong word. They were not barbarians. They were not uh, frenzied maniacs or uh, uncultured, unthinking, slow-moving people. They were very intelligent to do this work. And uh, it's unfair to judge them by the little scraps of pottery and a stone structure that has only just been interpreted. You could call it barbaric if you don't understand it. The archaeologist digs up bones. He doesn't dig up the brain. Why, if we're dug up in a thousand years, uh, we'll find bits of coffee cups and bits of Coke bottles. These might be interpreted as barbaric two thousand years from hence. Uh, you see, these people uh, were illiterate in that they did not write, but I don't think they were unintelligent. I regard these stones and the way they are set as a very permanent written record. In fact, every stone, every major stone and hole in this monument can be accounted for on the simple astronomical theory. So I feel that we have a very complex thing and it just cannot be by chance. In fact, the probability that I'm wrong, a millions to one uh, in my favor, was a very good odds. Professor Hawkins' theory is a very interesting one and Nobody can explain to me why there should be 56. If you're dividing a circle up, 56 is a very, very odd thing to do. And I've discussed this with distinguished mathematicians in Cambridge, like Fred Hoyle and Ray Littleton, and they both say it's quite possible. It's quite possible that people who were non-literate could have a kind of calculating machine of this kind. And so Stonehenge wasn't laid out in a haphazard way, and therefore, there is a reason for those 56 points.